boxing news. Ow! Okay, we'll start with this. Well, heavyweight contender and veteran Fast Eddie Chambers reacted to the news that Javante Davis is going to be moving up in weight to take on Mario Barrios for Mario Barrios's secondary WBA title. Baby belt. You know, one one person on Twitter reacted to the news by saying, if he beats the winner of Taylor versus Ramirez, sure. Anything else isn't a world title for now. To which Eddie Chambers responded, Canelo did not fight the top guys at 168 and 175 pounds either. Same situation with Tank. He will be a three-weight champion no matter the situation. Bullshit. And nothing could be further from the truth. How is he comparing Javante Davis to Canelo Alvarez when Canelo faced full-fledged world champions at both 175 and 168 pounds? I'm lying. That wasn't a secondary title that Canelo Alvarez won from Sergey Kovalev, and that wasn't a secondary title that he won from Callum Smith. So why is Eddie Chambers comparing the two? Because he wants Javante Davis to be viewed in the same light as a Canelo Alvarez, in spite of not having put in the work that Canelo Alvarez has. He wants people to look at Javante as a multi-weight champion. Even though Javante Davis hasn't faced full-fledged world champions in several weight classes, he's only actually ever faced full-fledged world champions in one weight class, the super featherweight division, when he fought Jose Pedraza for the IBF title there, and more recently when he fought Leo Santa Cruz, the full-fledged WBA champion at super featherweight as well. 130 pounds is the only division where Javante Davis has fought full-fledged world champions. Gamboa wasn't a full-fledged champion at 135. And in that vacant WBA regular title fight, that was a secondary title. Oh. Teofimo Lopez is in possession of the full version of the title. Did Javante Davis fight him? Is he about to? Because up until he does, he can't claim to be a world champion at 135 pounds. Eddie Chambers wants to compare Davis to Canelo. Is he serious? He's that about a bitch. Canelo Alvarez has fought three active reigning world champions, full-fledged world champions, at three different weights in his last four fights. Daniel Jacobs for the IBF at 160, Sergey Kovalev for the WBO at 175, and Callum Smith for the WBA title at 168 pounds. None of those titles were secondary titles. Here today, Canelo Alvarez is not in possession of any secondary belts. He is not a secondary champion. He's not. So why is it that Eddie Chambers wants Javante Davis to receive the same credit as a Canelo Alvarez to be viewed as... Equivocal to Canelo. Why does Eddie Chambers, among several others, want Javante Davis to be viewed in the same light as Canelo Alvarez when he is so obviously not putting in the same work against the same level of competition as a Canelo Alvarez? Nothing against Mario Barrios. For what it's worth, Mario Barrios will be one of the more solid guys that Javante Davis will have faced in recent memory. If I'm being honest, I view Mario Barrios as a more solid opponent for Javante Davis than Leo Santa Cruz was, because Leo Santa Cruz was just another little guy moving up in weight. Whereas Mario Barrios is a full-fledged 140-pound fighter, contender. We know that 140 pounds is not a weight that Javante Davis is going to struggle to make. It's a decent fight. No more, no less. But Eddie Chambers and the powers that be want to build this as something more, something more than what it actually is. Because every time a PBC fighter faces somebody halfway decent, you get guys like Eddie Chambers that want to blow it out of proportion. In his mind, this is a full-fledged title fight. And if Javante Davis should win, he considers him a three-division champion. Blowing this out of proportion. This is the same hierarchy of thought we saw in play when Deontay Wilder so decided to take on Luis Ortiz, a halfway decent heavyweight. Make no mistake, it was a solid fight, and at that time, Luis Ortiz was a solid fighter, but Deontay Wilder fighting him and beating him didn't make him the authority in the heavyweight division. It wasn't a historic fight, and there's nothing historic about the career of either Luis Ortiz or Deontay Wilder. But you ask Wilder's fans, and that fight made him king shit. That got blown out of proportion. The same way that Eddie Chambers and several others, several of Javante Davis's supporters, the same way they're trying to blow this out of proportion. Winning this fight won't make Javante Davis a full-fledged three-division champion. Most people know that. At this point, you're just insulting people's intelligence. Eddie Chambers and whoever's putting this thing together, whoever so decides to build this as a world championship title fight when this won't make either guy 
a full-fledged world champion. Till Mario Barrios fights the winner of Ramirez versus Taylor, he can't call himself a full-fledged world champion. In turn, if Javante Davis were to beat him, that wouldn't make him a world champion either, and we all know that. So why is it that so many people demand that Davis get extra credit for taking shortcuts? You get these guys that pledge their fealty to a fighter under any circumstance, and they think that the rest of the world is supposed to look at that fighter with blinders on. I don't know or care why you like the guy so much. Don't care if you grew up with him. Don't care if you're from the same city. From the same place, race, ethnicity. None of that shit matters. That only matters to you, and none of that is going to make this a full-fledged world title fight. None of that is going to make the winner of Davis versus Barrios a full-fledged world champion. You know, I reiterate, it's not a bad fight. Mario Barrios really would be one of the more solid guys that Javante Davis has faced in recent memory. But why is he supposed to get credit for facing a halfway decent fighter every so often when you've got guys that do that on a regular basis? Why is Davis supposed to get extra credit? Because you like him? This is how some people's minds work. I take that as a sign that their minds don't work. Javante Davis deserves about as much credit for beating Mario Barrios as beating Mario Barrios would get you. Mario Barrios, unbeaten contender that he might be, he's not the authority at 140 pounds. He's not a full-fledged champion there. So we're not going to look at the situation through that filter, through that lens. It's a solid fight, and Mario is a halfway decent fighter, no more and no less. That makes it a halfway decent win. Now, with this news of Javante Davis moving up to 140 pounds to take on Mario Barrios... This effectively puts Ryan Garcia in the hot seat because according to Ryan, he was putting everything else off for either a Manny Pacquiao fight, which we all know fizzled out, or a Javante Davis fight. And he's not going to be facing either of those fighters in the near future. He ain't facing any of them next. Is he free to fight Devin now? Because that's what the story was. If Ryan Garcia ends up fighting anyone other than Devin Haney in his very next fight, it's not going to be a good look. I mean, it just isn't. You can't sell me that you get out of bed for a Javier Fortuna or someone else, but you don't get out of bed for Devin Haney. Devin Haney has something that those other fighters don't have. And more importantly, more to the point, Devin Haney gets you more money than fighting anybody else. You know that fast that he wants to make that fight. Fair play. No, I can't knock that. But if you don't, you should be fighting your mandatory. Or the, the, who you're mandatory for. Right, Devin. For Devin Haney. That's a great fight. Right. Oh, it doesn't really excite me. What? Do you think you might get beat? You know, it sells out at Staples Center. Our broadcaster, the zone, are desperate for that fight. It's a massive fight. These guys, they keep saying, you know, they're, and they're not saying it. People talk about these guys as the four kings, like the old days. The only way that's going to happen is if they consistently fight each other. So let's get the ball rolling. That was clear, concise, and to the point. When Ryan Garcia says that he's not interested in fighting Devin Haney, what exactly is it that he's not interested in? He's not interested in getting beat. That's what it is, because that's what it sounds like. You can't convince me you get out of bed for AVF Watuna or Jorge Linares, any of these other guys out there, but for some reason you don't get out of bed for Devin Haney. The only way that works is if you're running away from something. You're trying to circumvent something with that statement. So it sounds to me. I'm not telling you that Javier Fortuna would be a bad fight for Ryan. I'm not telling you that Jorge Linares would be a bad fight for Ryan. Those are all solid fights, and those are all solid fighters for a young up-and-comer like Ryan Garcia. But you have to reconcile why it is that Ryan might be more willing to fight with those guys as opposed to Devin, who would get him a bigger payday in a fight that would garner a lot more attention than the aforementioned two fights with the aforementioned two fighters, and almost everyone else. I mean, short of Teofimo Lopez and short of Javante Davis. Short of those guys. You know, you're not going to get the same attention fighting Jorge or Javier that you get fighting Devin. You and I both know it. I'll tell you, this is how they guide these U.S. prospects along. I mean, if you look across the pond, if you look over at the United Kingdom, they put their unbeaten fighters, their young up-and-comers, in sink or swim situations that either make them better fighters for it or bring to light their flaws, their inadequacies. Well, both. Daniel Dubois learned a very hard lesson his last time out against the unbeaten Joe Joyce. But it's a lesson that he needed to learn because moving forward, there are holes that need to be patched up. It's a necessary evil. Whereas here in the United States with our unbeaten prospects, well, you guys see what we're dealing with. I don't need my big brother to do my dirty work for me. I'll call you. <laughs> you f and Barbie doll looking head ass mother Sorry bro, I didn't see you there. I was too busy being a massive
Jesus Christ, I don't know how you take yourself seriously looking like this. My God. I put it on a plate for you. I asked you if you wanted to fight and you decided to laugh it off as per usual. Stick to your little YouTube videos behind your little desk and don't come over to this boxing wheel because you'll get laid out in 30 seconds flat. You know, I figured this was what was going to happen as soon as a real fighter, a real boxer, gets involved. I mean, say what you want about young Tommy Fury's resume so far. Say what you want about his quality of competition. At the end of the day, you know what family he comes from. You know who he is. And you know, at minimum, you know, you know. that he is a boxer after all. I mean, this ain't some wrestler it ain't. that Jake Paul is challenging to a boxing match. This isn't some YouTube personality or some kind of an NBA basketball player. Tommy Fury, for all accounts, is a boxer. He's not the first boxer that wanted to kick Jake Paul's ass. Double gold medalist Clarissa Shields, undisputed middleweight champion, could be undisputed junior middleweight champion very soon. Antonio Tarver, world champion Antonio Tarver, now retired. They both would have relished the opportunity to beat the brakes off of young Jake Paul. What sets the Tommy Fury situation apart from those situations is, in those situations, those fighters are a lot more accomplished than Tommy Fury. And Clarissa Shields, you're talking about a double gold medalist. That, that's what she comes from. That's her pedigree. She knows boxing. In the professional game, she's been a world champion in several weight classes already. Needless to say, Jake Paul would be in over his head with Clarissa Shields. I'm sure of that. Moreover, a fighter as accomplished as Clarissa Shields, both in her amateur pedigree and her professional one, shouldn't be wasting her time on some YouTuber who wants to play boxer for a day. I think the same applies to Antonio Tarver, all his years of experience. Yeah. It's just not a good look for fighters that are as accomplished as either Clarissa or Antonio that want to beat up on some kid who got famous for being a moron on YouTube. It's not a good look. But Tommy and Jake, well, that's a different kettle of fish, and it's a different kettle of fish because Tommy Fury isn't an Olympic gold medalist. He's not yet a world champion. And who really knows if he ever will be? You often hear it said that there are levels. There are levels to the game. And Clarissa Shields' level. Antonio Tarver's level. You need me to tell you they're light years ahead of this kid? And that's why I view all three of those situations through a different lens. Clarissa's level, Antonio Tarver's level, they've competed at the championship level, the highest levels of the sport already. Tommy, Tommy's not there yet. And that's what makes it fair play. That it's not uneven terrain. What's Tommy Fury got? Five professional fights to Jake Paul's two? They're in a similar place. At least they are on paper. So let's see who they really are in the ring. With Clarissa and Antonio, it's overkill. It's overkill is what it is. Jake Paul don't belong within 50 feet of either of those fighters. They'd fucking kill him. And when either one of those fighters decide to call him out, it gives you the impression that they're clout chasing him because his name is buzzing right now more than theirs. It's not a good look, no matter how you slice it. Let the clown do his clown shit. But Tommy, he's a bit of a public figure the way that Jake Paul is a public figure. Tommy was on Love Island. TV show. Tommy isn't light years ahead of Jake Paul in terms of resume because Tommy's just getting his career off the ground. He's just getting started. Both of those kids, at least on paper, are in a similar place. Thus, a contest between them isn't overkill, isn't impractical. It's beneath Clarissa and Antonio to waste their time on this kid. It should be. It should be beneath Antonio and Clarissa to spend any time on this attention-seeking drug addict who got famous for being a jackass in front of everybody. With Tommy, it's different because Tommy's in the early stages of his career the same way that Jake Paul is in the early stages of his career. Both of these guys, they only got a handful of fights, if that. They ain't even got ten fights between them. Jake Paul wants to play boxer for a day, so let's put him in there with a boxer. Who's in a similar a place to Jake to showcase what distinguishes boxers, real boxers, real fighters from people like Jake. And it's not unfair. It's not overkill. It's perfectly practical. And finally, per tweet from Michael Benson, the winner of Jamel Herring versus Carl Frampton on April 3rd will have an immediate mandatory defense of the WBO Super Featherweight title against Shaklor Stevenson. Bob Arum has said that if Frampton wins, they do the Shaklor defense as a stadium fight in Northern Ireland. Well, how many of you guys out there are convinced that Carl's going to win? Because I don't think it's a foregone conclusion that he does. I think that he's got a sizable test in front of him in the reigning champion, Jamal Herring. I mean, how many of you guys out there are confident that Carl's going to win that fight? At this point, 
I don't even think Shakur is too hung up over who the winner of the fight is going to be. He just wants to challenge the winner of the fight. After things fizzled out with Josh Warrington. He never got to fight Oscar Valdez at 126. Still hasn't gotten that chance at 130. And he might not for some time. The winner of Herring versus Frampton, whoever it is, has a young lion waiting for them. That's cause for concern. For the winner of the fight it is. Just not clear who the winner of the fight is going to be because this is Carl Frampton we're talking about. Carl Frampton who was outworked and smothered by Josh Warrington. Josh Warrington who just suffered his first professional loss at the hands of Mauricio Lara. Oh. You know, Josh has his virtues, but punch and power really ain't one of them. He's not a big puncher, it's safe to say that. Nevertheless, in spite of not being all that big a puncher, he did outwork Carl Frampton now, didn't he? And that was at featherweight. That was at 126. What we're talking about now is at 130. Jamel Herring is a naturally bigger guy than Carl Frampton, a noticeably bigger guy. Some people out there, they're not too impressed with how Jamel looked defending his title against Oquendo. There were those people. That's fine. You're all entitled to your opinions. But was Jamel's performance against Oquendo enough to convince you that Carl's going to pry that WBO title away from him? Who do you think is going to win that fight? And who do you think will thereby adopt the responsibility of satisfying their mandatory challenger in Shaklor Stevenson? It's a hot potato. I Sooner or later, somebody's going to have to deal with this kid. Sooner or later, somebody's going to have to take him on. Hypothetically speaking. Just hypothetically. If Carl Frampton were to win the WBO title from Jamel Herring, do you think he'd take on Shaklor Stevenson thereafter? Immediately after. Because he would have to. In order to keep the WBO title, he'd have to satisfy his mandatory challenger or forfeit the title to Shaklor. Do you guys think if Carl wins that Jamel Herring fight, he's going to go right into a Shaklor Stevenson fight? How do we know he won't shoot for Oscar Valdez? How do we know he won't attempt to circumvent his mandatory challenger by participating in a unification match? How do we know? They'd still need Shaklor's blessing. They would still need for Shaklor to step aside. Similar to the situation at heavyweight between Anthony Joshua, his mandatory challenger, Oleksandr Yusik, and Tyson Fury. Part of me feels that Shaklor is more likely to get the winner of that fight if the winner of that fight is Jamel Herring. But if it's Carl Frampton, I don't know. Who says the guy don't retire right after the fight?